Greetings and salutations to everybody out there in podcast land. This is the Judo Chop Suey Podcast, and I'm your host, Judo Dave Roman. I'm very excited to be back behind the microphone once again to talk. Actually, this time, I'm not talking all things judo. For this episode, I'm going to talk all things Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Yeah, I know, the shock and horror, right? So yeah, I wanted to go in a different direction with this particular episode because for for many of you that may uh, know or don't know or whatever the case may be, I have been doing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu over the past year as a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu student, not just a judo guy dabbling in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu just to kind of shore up his ground game, Not, not with that kind of approach. I have been a dedicated student to BJJ for the past year plus or so. So I wanted to do an episode dedicated to talk about my experiences in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu because I think there are a lot of takeaways that I've had. Actually, I know there's been a lot of takeaways that I've had over the past year, and I want to bring up and discuss some of those things, some of the things that are accurate, some of the things that are inaccurate when it comes to a judoka's point of view on Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And to discuss all of this with me, I am bringing on uh, my friend, my training partner, Judo Joe, a little bit later in this episode to talk about this kind of stuff. So on this episode, I'm going to talk about my experiences in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. We're going to talk, uh, have a conversation with Judo Joe. And I want to really d- deep dive into some of the misconceptions that a, a lot of Judo folks have about Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu misconceptions and flat out inaccuracies but I also want to uh, bring up some of the truths that some some of us judo folks have about Brazilian jiu-jitsu so before I would get into any of that uh, about uh, maybe about two or three weeks ago the, it was promotion night at uh, Ebor City Jiu-Jitsu Club which is where I train well, we're moving on now. Moving on so I'd like to give a special shout out to some of the people that got promoted on that night. Uh, really, all of the people I promote, promoted on that night and that morning. So congratulations to Austin and Randy for earning their purple belts. Congratulations to Hugo, Tom, uh, Jack Swagger, Dave Roman, Rambo. No, not that Rambo. And Brittany for earning their blue belts. Uh, yeah, that's right. Your ears did not deceive you. I earned my blue belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Now, hopefully I didn't forget anybody off of that list. Those are the people that I was aware of. So I want to take a moment to talk about how I feel about being promoted to Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I'm sure those of you who follow me on Instagram or Facebook uh, already know that I got promoted to blue belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I was the 69th person promoted by the club to blue belt. And I'm also happy about that. 69, <laughs> dudes! All right. Um, so, yeah, blue belt. Uh, there, there's two things that I know about the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu blue belt. So, And they go as follows. One, the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu blue belt is the black belt of quitting Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And two, if your instructor wants you to quit Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, all he's got to do is give you a blue belt. <laughs> Those are not my jokes. I'm sorry if they came off flat, so... So yeah, I know there there's a long standing uh, uh, or there's there's apparently an attrition problem in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu when it comes to blue belt, but um, I would say that the the judo black belt is the black belt of quitting judo. So it it, go, it goes both ways because you know there's a lot of adults out there once they reach their shodan, they're like they they think they've they've climbed that mountain and they're finally at the summit and and it's all downhill from there. But no, that's actually not true. In judo, and it's certainly not true in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Now, for me, it took about a year to the day for me to get uh, promoted to blue belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu, and it's not because I was really terrible on the ground. Um, I, I, it just that's just how long it took me. And you know, when I came into Brazilian jiu-jitsu, I obviously, I, as many of you know, I've had 13 years experience in in judo and. When I started Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu at Ybor City on an official capacity, and I'll explain that in a moment, I had a leg up on everybody else that was starting Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu who has not had a previous uh, experience in, in, in martial arts or any sort of a grappling sport. And what I mean by an, an official capacity is 
being a consistent member of a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu club. Now, if you want to take the very first time I stepped on the mats, then hell, it took me 20 years to earn my blue belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu because I, the first exposure I had to Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu was back in 1999 at Boston Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. It was either 1999 or 2000. I can't remember, but I know I did that for a couple of months and then I moved to Florida. And then shortly after I moved to Florida, I met a fellow by the name of Eduardo de Lima who ran a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu club out of his garage in Clearwater, Florida. And that's where I met a fellow for the very first time. He doesn't remember this, but I met him for the first time, a fellow by the name of Joey Best. And Joey uh, was a let's see, a three or four stripe white belt at the time. And now Joey is my Brazilian jiu-jitsu instructor. So it's kind of cool that uh, that somebody who I've seen as a white belt is now a black belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu and he's my uh, ju- uh, jiu-jitsu instructor. So it goes to show you that Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belts just don't descend out of the heavens and, and impart us with their knowledge of Brazilian jiu-jitsu. It's, it's a long road taken. It's a lot of hard work, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. Just like in judo, it's just, just a different path and a different sport. So I've been in and out of different Brazilian jiu-jitsu clubs really over the past 20 years, but it wasn't until 2006 that I committed to a grappling sport and, and way, uh, if you want to call it that, which I do. Uh, I've been doing judo since 2006. That is my first love when it comes to grappling sports. And I still primarily consider myself a judoka, not just because I'm a Nidan, but that's just where, of the two, judo and Brazilian jiu-jitsu, my passion is still with judo, but man, Brazilian jiu-jitsu is a close second. And I have really come to appreciate the differences of Brazilian jiu-jitsu. However, I, I must say that over the years since I started doing judo, I've, I've popped in and out of Brazilian jiu-jitsu clubs from time to time, you know, spent a, a month here, a couple months there. And I was just uh, acting like a judo guy, just doing Brazilian jiu-jitsu, trying to incorporate a little bit here and there into my game. But I would say over the past year, I have been approaching being a student not as a judo guy learning Brazilian jiu-jitsu, but as a person learning Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And I, th- I think the mindset is a little bit different. And, you know, speaking of mindset, I think my mindset entering Brazilian jiu-jitsu this time around over the past year, if there's one thing judo has helped me with over the past year when it comes to Brazilian jiu-jitsu, it's the mindset for training. Because at my age, middle age now, I have a more mature approach to sparring and learning and rondori than I did 10 years ago. And I think the one thing that I've brought into my training in in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu that I've taken away from Judo is really having a very short memory when it comes to submissions uh, during practice. And what I mean by that is when I do Judo these days and probably over the past two years or so, I literally don't care about being thrown. It does it does not phase me one bit. The only time I care about being thrown is when somebody is being reckless with my health and safety. That's when I really care. But other than that, like if I'm I if I'm working on something specific and I get caught in a throw because I'm trying to improve my own judo, I literally don't care. I don't I don't try and spin out. I just take the fall. I go at about uh, you know a sixty to seventy percent pace in Rondori. Taking getting thrown does not matter to me because I've come to con- to the conclusion that the evaluation of my judo is not done by the people who I'm training with. Which when I got promoted to Nidan, you know, uh, uh, nearly a year ago, that was my biggest takeaway from from taking that test and and passing a test is that I was evaluated by somebody who knows a heck of a lot more judo than I do, and can evaluate students properly. So when it comes to Brazilian jiu-jitsu, I'm taking the same mindset as well because there's two main instructors, um, Chris and Joey, and then there's also uh, the beginner's class ins- instructor who's, who's uh, uh, his nickname is Crucial, so I'll just leave it at that. But when it comes to sparring in Brazilian jiu-jitsu, I try and take as make as many mistakes as possible and take as many risks as possible. Not risks with my my health or other people's health, but 
I try things and experiment because I literally do not care about getting tapped out. Now, the one thing that makes me lose sleep during practice, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm rolling with somebody and I can't pass their guard, boy, do, do I have a rough night sleeping because I, that one I can't seem to let go of. But, you know, getting caught in submissions, I don't care about that. And I think bringing that, that, uh, that I don't care attitude from judo in, in terms of getting thrown and incorporating that into Brazilian jiu-jitsu, that has been a very helpful thing for me in order to develop uh, some of my jiu-jitsu skills. And along those lines, I personally do not put much stock in defending the belt because the people, again, the, the people who I'm defending the belt against, they don't evaluate my skills. They don't evaluate me. So it doesn't, it doesn't matter to me what they think of my jiu-jitsu. The only thing that matters to me is what my instructors are thinking. So for me to be promoted by them is, is a very great honor, and, and I'm very proud of that. Now, I'd like to take a moment to talk about some of the things that I've learned in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu over the past year and, and some of the, the similarities between Judo and Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I must say that in terms of hold downs and in terms of some of the basic movements like shrimping and escaping uh, and certainly submissions in the gi, we're talking about you know arm bars and, and certain chokes, I don't think there was anything new that I've learned over the past year. And I don't mean that as a slight towards towards the instructors or anything like that. It's just in terms of the basics when it comes to Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, a lot of a lot of the basics were already there for me. I would say about eighty percent of of things that I was shown and seen in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, I've already seen once before. But that being said, it is the level of detail. And the finer points of all of these techniques that I'm really blown away at when it comes to Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And I, and I think that a lot of that has to do with the way that the sport is constructed. Because, yeah, Judo has a lot of nawaza, and, and I don't, I'm not going to pretend that it doesn't or anything like that. But the way the game is played in, in, in competition, it doesn't leave you a lot of time to set up submissions after submissions and, and move around in a way that that um, you can in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu in, in sports Jiu-Jitsu. You just, you just don't have that kind of time. And I don't, you know, and I'm going to get into this later. This nonsense, this idea that many people perpetrate that, that Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu has nothing new to offer. I, I vehemently disagree with that. But as far as individual techniques, you know, uh, Keisa Katame, uh, Yoko Shio Katame, you know, Juji Katame, uh, all, all the Shimewaza, all of that is there in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And I think sometimes what happens with some judo guys that visit a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu club, like sometimes they may just show up one day and it ends up being a class in, in you know, let's say case like Atami. And, you know, the, the, the judo guy might walk away thinking, there's nothing new here, but, but you're wrong. Now, I'm not suggesting the case like Atami itself is new, but... If one were to go to a class and, and only see that and never, never, ever visit again, you would really miss out on, on really the depth of, of what one can find in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Before I bring Joe on, I also wanted to talk briefly about some of the key differences in club size when it comes to Judo versus Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, at least from what I can talk about in the United States and in my local area, which I believe is a reflection of what happens throughout the rest of this country and throughout uh, many other English-speaking countries. And I'm not going to deep dive into this because I know I've already talked about this in episodes past with regards to the statistics on search Google search criteria when it comes to judo and Brazilian jiu-jitsu, at least in English-speaking countries. And if you haven't heard those episodes, the, the long story short is that when you look at the Google Trends metrics uh, for English-speaking countries, and I'm talking primarily about Canada, the United States, the UK, and Australia, uh, not to exclude other English-speaking countries, but I'm just talking about those particular countries. The growth and search interest, uh, according to Google Trends, of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu versus Judo uh, is really in Jiu-Jitsu's favor, and in some areas it's in Jiu-Jitsu's favor by a large margin. And the only time that Judo ever has any more interest from a Google Trend point of view 
over Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is during the Olympics. So every four years, you see a spike. But by and large, in, in those countries, uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is more popular. Now, within the United States, it's my understanding as well that, that Florida, which is the state that I live in, is a hotbed for really not only judo. It's, it's not as big as California, uh, but, but judo is pretty popular in Florida. But uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu apparently is a hotbed, um, or, or Florida is also a hotbed of, for Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And, and in particular, the Tampa Bay area, because I believe we have a few jiu-jitsu world champions teaching in Tampa Bay. And I'm not talking about like a blue belt world champion. I'm talking about people that have won black belt divisions at the highest level of jiu-jitsu competition. And most notably, I think in this area, Hobson Mora. Uh, teaches Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu in Tampa Bay. There's also Eduardo de Lima, who I believe was a multiple-time uh, winner at the Pan American Games for Jiu-Jitsu. And, of course, Dr. Roddy Ferguson is certainly a, most, uh, a very notable name in judo circles, but he's also, I've never rolled with him, but I'm, I'm told he's an excellent uh, uh, Jiu-Jitsu guy. And it's my understanding he, he recently got his I think fourth degree or fifth degree in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And if I'm not mistaken, he may be a Rokudan in Judo now. And I'm sure I'm missing a bunch of people in, in the Tampa Bay area. But my overall point is what I'm trying to say is that Jiu-Jitsu in my local area is pretty huge. And I know it's huge in California. I know it's huge in New York. And, you know, the point that I wanted to get to, uh, given Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu's popularity compared to Judo in the United States... As far as I know, there's approximately 30,000 judoka in the United States. And if you were to you know, divide that by 50, you know, 50 states, of course, you, you've probably got about, on average, 600 judoka in every state. I know in Florida, that's probably a little bit more than that, maybe anywhere between uh, you know, 600 to 800 judoka in, in Florida. But I would say in terms of jiu-jitsu practitioners— there's probably over seven or 800 jiu-jitsu practitioners in Tampa Bay alone. And if I were to count up every single member of just my club alone, there's probably over 100 students between a, a variety of ranks. So the amount of training partners that I've had over the past year in, in jiu-jitsu is massive compared to the adult training partners that I've had in judo. It, it's not even close. You know, I think the most judoka I have seen on a single mat is about 30 adults, and, and that's usually at an open mat area. Really, the open mats that we've had at my club is the most amount of judoka I've seen in one mat space. Now, I know there are people that I've talked to over the years that, that are from other countries where their classes average about 50 adults um, per session. Now, now that's I've never seen that in my life. Certainly not in the United States. I know um, the Florida School of Judo locally um, probably has about 30 adult students, but I, I, that's largely because they are affiliated with the local YMCA, which, by the way, I, I would like to say something uh, unrelated to jiu-jitsu. My first judo sensei, Professor Edwin Maley, has passed away, and I just learned the news of this yesterday. And by yesterday, I'm talking about October 2nd. I received a text message from one of my longtime training partners. And, and Professor Maley was, gosh, he had to have been in his uh, early to mid-90s. And he was a, he's a legendary judo figure. He was a fixture in the local Tampa Bay community for decades. He taught judo for, uh, for over 70 years. And he opened up the Florida School of Judo. Florida School of Judo in 1963. He was an Air Force veteran. And he's probably taught about, gosh, no less than 10,000 students throughout his time. I mean, that that's probably a very conservative number. I'd venture to guess a more realistic number is like 30,000 over, over 70 years. It's my understanding that he started judo sometime in the late 1940s, and he served in the Air Force, as I already mentioned. And um, he was a pioneer in American judo in his own way. I, I know he used to be, fr or I know he was friends with Gene LaBelle. He mentioned that once uh, a long, long time ago to me. And it wouldn't surprise me if he knew Don Drager. I, I mean, 
every significant person in American judo history, uh, he probably knew and knew very well. So this is a huge loss for judo in the United States. And for those American judoka, even if you've never heard of him, uh, rest assured he's a pioneer in American judo. There's no doubt about that in my mind. So to the Meili family, friends, and students, uh, I offer my condolences to you. Um, rest in peace, Professor Meili. So where was I going with that? Oh, um, yeah, class sizes. As I was saying, I've never had so many training partners on one mat um, in my life. And there, there's times where we're rolling – yeah, there, there's almost too many people on the mat, and we we gotta set the uh, set people aside, and we got a pretty big mat space, in my opinion. So anyway, look, I've been babbling quite uh, well over 20 minutes now, and I've got to bring Joe on. So there's the music, and without further ado, Mr. Joe Kaiser. Joe, welcome back to the Judah Chop Suey Podcast. How you doing today? Great, great. Thanks for having me back again. I really appreciate you coming back on. I wanted to bring you back on because, you know, we've been doing judo together for a long time, and we've also been doing Brazilian jiu-jitsu together for the past year. As of this recording, I've been a member of the club uh, on an official capacity for a, a, almost a year to the day. I, if I were to look at the, w- when I get charged my club dues, it's probably either going to be today or tomorrow. So and that's And I get charged when I signed up, so... Uh, so it's probably a year to the day, just about. Um, wow, that's awesome. Yeah. So I wanted to bring you on. I'm calling this episode the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu episode because I really want to get deep dive into our thoughts on Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and the things that we kind of learn through Jiu-Jitsu and what those differences are. And I also want to delve into... Um, you know, because I, I, I'm getting my purple, um, or I've gotten my blue belt and I, I'm going to be working toward my purple belt. It's going to take years, of course. And I want to kind of deep dive into some of the accuracies and, and flat out inaccuracies when it comes to the perceptions of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Does, does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I guess what I want to talk about is is some of my thoughts on doing jujitsu over the past year. You know, we've been doing a lot of training together. You've you've certainly helped me improve over the past year as a uh, I, I don't know, a BJJer if you want to call it that uh, huh. a, a jujitsu doka. I don't I don't know what the official term is. I'll just call it a grappler. Uh, just for the that works. Yeah, that works. So I'll just so over the past year, what I found interesting is I've always maintained, at least just as an observer, that the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu blue belt, in terms of knowledge and ability, is the equivalent to a sankyu in in judo. Do you do you agree with that? Um, I mean it's it's really kind of difficult to to cross them over be, just because of the the you know the curriculum is different right what i would say uh, one thing i will say to me the most important belt uh, in jiu-jitsu obviously other than your black belt is your blue belt interesting because i think because i think at that point you've learned all of the fu- basics and fundamentals right not saying that you've mastered them but you you've pretty much seen everything that you're going to see in its basic form at blue belt right your your sweet you've probably done, you've worked on all the different sweeps you've worked on transitions you've worked on uh you know your submissions obviously um so to me when you get your blue earning the blue belt is a, a big step yeah uh, it, it, one of the biggest i like i said i think other than your black belt it's probably the most important because the, the, the belts between that, you know, your, your, your purple and your brown belt, you're really just sharpening the sword at that point. You're, you're learning different ways to get to, uh, you know, where you want to be, which, which is ultimately, you know, in a submission. So it, it's kind of like, you know, you, you've learned the game of chess at that point. You know the rules. You know what needs to be done. And uh, and I like I said, I think your your next two levels, your purple and your brown, you're just you're sharpening that 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 technique. So See, I think the blue belt is a very 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 important. The, it, 
I agree that the blue belt's important, but boy, I got to tell you, when I evaluate my skills to somebody that's a purple belt, I mean, the, the gap is pretty big. And I, for, at least for me, and coming into jiu- coming into jujitsu, like I, I felt that I had pretty good ground game for a judo guy. And even with that experience, I still felt that I could hang with with uh, so, certainly some of the blue belts, especially when they're you know closer in size and age. I can hang with them, but when I look at my skills objectively, I don't think there's a there's a there's a purple belt. Um, that I could objectively look at and be like, yeah, I can hang with him because there, because there isn't. And, and I just, and I think for me, there are little things that like guard, certain guard passes and, and, and certain sweeps that I, I know I just can't do. And like, you, so I do agree with your statement that a lot of the basics at blue belt are there. So, you know, whether that's side side control or, or North South or, or, or Mount or or whatever the case may be, a lot of those basics are there arm bars, you know, certainly lapel chokes and, and rear naked chokes and, you know, chokes like uh, Hadaka Jime coming right, you know, straight in and, and, and stuff like that. But I, I feel for myself that there's such a huge gap between blue belt and purple belt that, which is why I kind of equate, you know, where I, for myself, I kind of equate the, the blue belt, kind of the Sankyu and the, the, the purple belt is kind of like the, the black belt in judo. Like, like in terms of mad hours and experience and, and ability, that that's kind of how I see it for myself. Like I, yeah, I can't tell you, I could probably, I probably know two sweeps, like say from half guard. Um, actually, no, I know three, three or four, but but there's other ones that I just, I I just don't I I I don't know, and I probably haven't even seen yet. And and there's uh you know the other week we were working on on uh, on passing the knee shield and being in somebody's half guard, and and you showed me a a pass that I've just never seen before. And, and I'd like to add these are things that I could spend the next 20 years in judo and never see any of this if I was just doing judo alone. And I think we'll, we'll get to that subject there, but yeah, I just, I just think that, that I I feel in, in some ways I feel like, yeah, I can hang with blue belts. But then when I, when I roll with other people, I'm like, my God, that gap is just so large uh, between blue and purple. I I can, I see for myself why it can take, uh, maybe another four or five years before I could even get my, you know, or, or earn a not get, but earn a purple belt. You know what I mean? Yeah, you, you know, I, and I, I think one putting it in judo terms, you know, like you were saying, I only have one or three or four sweeps, but I, I think it's it's really one of those things when you look at even guys at the top level, they really only have three or four sweeps too. They're just so proficient at it, and it's one of those things where. You know, we learn a lot, a lot of techniques and, you know, we drill them and we go out and run door, you know, and sparring and rolling and, and we try to hit them. And sometimes we're like, man, I, I just can't pull that off. And I, I, I liken that to, to judo in a way. It's like there's a lot of throws that I can demonstrate. And you would think, man, you, you must have a really nice Tayatoshi. Well, the, the truth is I don't really have a very good Tayatoshi, or at least I don't have confidence in my Tayatoshi. Uh, I can show it to you and, you know, and I can, there, there's guys that I show it to and I'm like, yeah, I wish, man, I wish I could do it as good as you. Uh, and I think that, you know, there's a lot of that in BJJ as well. You know, like I only have one or two sweeps that I like to do. You know, I, I have some from half guard, from X guard, uh, but I don't have that many either, but I just really concentrate my efforts on getting proficient at those one or two sweeps. And honestly, at, at some point it's good enough. Uh, you know, there's guys at the highest level in BJJ that really only do a couple of things. Uh, Padre Gracie comes to mind. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's capable of doing many things, but when you watch him go out and compete, uh, man, he, first of all, Padre Gracie has great stand up. He's, he's at minimum showdown level judo. Interesting. But 
when you watch him on the ground, he's not doing any of these crazy Barambolo, uh, Omoplatas, or he's doing what people have dubbed basic jujitsu. He's just doing it at such a high level that guys know what he's going to do and they can't stop him. And, you know, I, I that's where I sometimes, you know, we, we want, we get discouraged a little bit, like when we're learning all these techniques and, and BJJ and it's like, man, uh, it's like when we, we've, we've done a lot of like, uh, Baron Bolo stuff at the club, you know, Baron yeah. Bolo to back take Baron Bolo. Sweet. I'm terrible at it. I'll, I'll be honest with you. Like there's white belts that'll, that could do that twice as good as me. But, and you know, it's, at some points I'm like, man, it, it's frustrating. But then at other points I think to myself, you know, I don't have to add that to my game. I have other things that I can do that I can do well that I don't need to focus so much on this one technique. I try to do it every time and I, and every time, you know, I get a little better at it, but I, I don't really focus too much on the amount of techniques that I can do. I, I guess I just focus on sharpening the ones that I, I, I've come to, you know, be good at. Yeah, that, that, that's really interesting. So do you think that maybe for myself going from blue belt to purple belt, that that kind of should be my uh, approach? Because I, I tell you, like, I think it's good to know body movements like what we practiced, uh, Barambolo and, and things like that. And I, I see young guys, even white belts at the club that they, they do things that I just – I I simply can't physically do, and it's not for lack of trying. I, and it's not because I'm uncoordinated, because I'm very coordinated. It's just, you know, their range of motion, their flexibility, their energy. Like I, yeah, I feel like I have to find a way to neutralize that. That goes toward my strengths. You know, you know. Absolutely, and what you know, there was a couple of key things you said there. It's that that range of motion, that flexibility, the the age. You know, like, you know, our our, our backs are, aren't as uh, not going to get in the same positions that some of these guys are going to be able to get in. And really, it's just that style. People have different styles, right? Uh, some guys like heavy top pressure and uh, pressure passing. And other guys like to play guard. And they, they feel really good on bottom, elevating and sweeping and elevating right into position to submit and you, it's it's really it's it's two different style there's many different styles right to attack in in bjj and you know like i consider myself more of a, a top top guy with with good pressure passing and good transitions i mean i can if i get on the bottom you know i have a couple of things like i said i have a couple of sweeps or i have a couple of skates that I can get, I can utilize to at least get myself back to a neutral position or maybe even get back to top position. So I, I think it's really, I, that transition like you're talking about, or that journey from blue to purple yeah, is, is probably going to be more finding what you do well and just sharpening it, you know, setting up somebody to make them move to where you can do what you like to do. That's, that's the big, the big thing for me. Yeah, and you know when I roll with you, and you're you're not just at a pur you're not just a purple belt. You're you're really an experienced purple belt now, and and like, it's it's interesting when you say when I roll with you, I, and I I get caught in a lot of things because you you set up, it, it's almost like ch chess in the sense that you set up a move, three or four moves ahead. You you secure you know, a particular grip or, or whatever the case may, may be in, in, in that sense. And that's where I'm not, that's where I'm not just period where I'm thinking I'm more like one or two steps ahead. If I get this grip, okay, now I'm going to try and sweep, but there's, there's things that you do where you have a, 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 a seems like a path in mind that that's four or five moves ahead. It's really, it's really interesting. Cause sometimes you'll, you know, let's say I just have you in a really bad half guard or something. You, you, you'll secure, you'll put your head like on my chest and you secure a grip, but, but then that's really all to set up uh, an, an arm triangle that takes you another three or four movements to eventually get to. 
And I, and I think it's really interesting to see, you know, where I'm at compared to what you do on the ground. And, and it's just, um, I know I'll get there eventually, but again, that's kind of what I talk about that, that gap between blue belt and purple belt is, is, is really huge. I mean, from what I see. Um, yeah. I mean, but you know, but like you said, you will get there and yeah. it, it's huge, but I gotta be honest, man. That's the exciting part, right? It's knowing that I'm, you're going to like when I roll with uh, brown belts and, and black belts and even though sometimes you know what they're going to do and you're like, they still, like you said, they're two or three steps ahead of me. And I'm like, man, I, w that's it. This is, I want to get to that point. And th that's, you know, that's what the, the most exciting thing about that keeps us coming back. Right. Is we know at some point you're not, we're not going to give up. It's not like a year from now, you're going to be like, man, purple belt's too hard. I'm, I give up. You're going to be, you're going to be there four or five times a week and you're going to get your roles in. And then you're, you're going to start piecing together your game. Yeah. You're going to do, you're going to, you're going to find that, like you said, the pattern that you like, you're going to secure this grip because, well, if he turns his back to me, I'm going to, I'm going to go S mount. But if he turns away from me, I'm going to, you know, just step up and get my hooks in there you're going to be sitting there uh with your next two steps plan a and plan b you know and that's that's when it becomes really fun you know something interesting you said and you're right you know in a year or two now for i'm not going to quit um because you know i've been doing grappling sports for over 13 years now and i've i've had I've had my share of injuries. One of them actually kept me out of judo for well over a year, but I came back and now I'm doing jujitsu. It's, this is in me, you know, grappling ju judo, Brazilian jujitsu. I mean, if there was a Samba club in, in, in locally in Tampa, I, I, I check it out as well. This is, this is in my, my body. This is, this is in me. This is for life. But there are there is an attrition problem in jujitsu, isn't there? Especially when it comes to blue belt. Isn't isn't there I, I've I've always I heard this joke a long time ago that uh, the the Brazilian the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu blue belt is the black belt of quitting Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Have you <laughs> seen <laughs> have no. you seen that kind of attrition at that club or do you agree that there is a drop off at blue when it comes to people sticking around for the long term? One hundred percent. There and, is, and and I think it goes back to what I was saying about it being the most important belt. The path from the get, obviously, me and you were a little bit different when we stepped on the mat for BJJ. We were already grappling, right. so it wasn't like a foreign world to us. But guys who come in off the street, you know, they watch UFC or they they a friend tells them about this and drags them to the club. Uh, or somebody's just passing by and sees the club. Hey, I'd like to try that. Yeah. The guy who walks in there or, or gal who walks in there with no experience after that first class or two, this is, it's got to seem like the highest mountain. You know, you see guys in there who are like purple belts, brown belts, and you see what they're doing. And then you remember you, you here you are on your second day. And you see some guy do a bear and bolo back take to a bow and arrow choke or something. Yeah. And you're like, I just, I just learned how to shrimp hip escape today. Yeah, well, right. You know what I mean? So what I think happens is that path, the blue belt is tough, you know, for, for the person straight off, off the street, it could be a couple of years. And I think maybe sometimes when they get that, that they think that that the path from blue to purple is the same. And they're like, they, maybe they lose interest. They're like, you know what? I worked hard enough. This is good enough. Uh, you know, I want to start doing something else or whatever. I don't know what it is, but you're right. The blue belt is where if you stay in after your blue belt and you're, you're still coming there every day and working hard, those are the people that they're going to be all the way to black belt. They're not, yeah. gonna get, they're, you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't see me or you not walking out of there with a black belt someday well yeah one day unless i you, you know croak before <laughs> or something yeah, like yeah. that you know it might, it might take that long till i hit 60 i i personally would my personal goal if i were to have a goal i, I would like to be a purple belt before i'm 50 
um that that would be nice um not that not that i need to put a a, a date on it or anything but I, I I actually have two personal goals. I'd like to be a Sandan and and at least a purple belt uh, before I'm fifty. Uh, I, ideally, and, uh, and those are both well within your reach. I think so. Yeah, yeah. I, I think yeah. so. So long as I I train the right way, um, and and take care of my body, uh, which I have to be a lot more proactive at uh, at uh, you know at my age compared to even just five years ago quite frankly and it's 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 tough it's that in itself in of it itself is a grind it, it uh, i don't know about is. you i don't know about you you seem to be okay most of the time but yeah well trust me it's it's just it's a facade because <laughs> I'm, I'm definitely you know especially the, the back pain it, it's there it's it's a daily thing but you know i i i do stuff to mitigate that and uh you know, I can't let it keep me off the mats. Nothing too serious. If it's just dealing with some aches and pains, I, you know, I can do it. Yeah. So. Yeah. So, you know, this past uh, week or so has been the first time in, in since January where I could pretty much say that I'm 100 um, percent. And that's that's very rare. And it, it's unfortunate that um, I, I, you know, this this tournament that was just recent the other day, I. I would have liked to have competed in that, but I, you know, with these injuries, I, I didn't get, I didn't feel like I got the amount of reps that I needed. And I certainly didn't do myself any favors with nutrition because I, I need to compete at that 154 level, not, uh, where I'm currently sitting at 160 and, uh, yeah, you know, that, that I, easy to get there. Yeah. 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 It's not, it, it's harder than it used to be, but it's, it's not impossible for sure. Do you ever discriminate? Uh, against training partners not 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 racially discriminate <laughs> do, no, do you, i know exactly where you're going with this do you ever I, like uh get a feel for the room or, or maybe get a feel for a certain guy and, and you're like well you know i don't know if i should go with this guy because it's 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 not it's not going to be a role it's going to be a fight do, do you ever feel that way um yes and you know um i'll, I'll be honest like, uh, I'm not a big fan of, and this is just me personally, I'm, I'm, I'm not disparaging other people from doing it, Sure. but like, um, you know, like on an open mat situation where you have, you know, we have people come in from like all, schools all over the area. If I don't know a guy, honestly, I probably won't roll with him. And it's not anything personal. It's just at my age. For me, the most important thing is to be able to get on the map, right? The next day, and right. The next day. And some purple belt from another school, you know, maybe they don't train the way we do. Maybe they go a lot harder. Maybe, you know, uh, cranking a wrist lock is uh, amongst training partners over there is completely, you know, fine. I don't know this guy. So I, I don't know how it's going to go. So a lot of times, you know, I, I'm very observant of everyone at the club and, you know, pretty much there isn't anybody at our club that I won't not roll with. Um, there are definitely people that I'm more cautious with and it's not because of anything mal they're being malicious or, you know, purposely trying to hurt anybody, but right. some people are just, you know, strong and sometimes don't know their own strength and maybe they explode into techniques that, you know, I wouldn't want somebody to explode into me on or, or something of that nature. But, uh, I, you know, I, I have a, like I said, at our club, we everybody's super respectful and everybody's pretty much on the same page. So uh, I don't have a, too, too many of those folks that I train with on a normal basis that I wouldn't roll with. But I definitely understand the sentiment. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, I, I find myself... <sighs> I won't refuse to train with anybody, but if, if I'm hurt, I will, you, you know, and unfortunately I've been hurt for the past, you know, except recently I've been hurt for eight or nine months. So I've had to, I've had to be very cautious on, on who I roll with. It's just, um, you know, not, not for anything personal, but you know, I, I do observe how certain people roll and there are times where I'm like, I, I, I can't go with you. And it has nothing to do with, um, with size, like take, um, like even when I was hurt, I I would still if I saw Keon was available for a role, for example, I'd still grab him. And you know, Keon's about he's got at least uh, 
120 pounds on me, I think, or, or maybe about yeah. a hundred, maybe a hundred, but you, you know, or, or maybe some of the bigger purple belts. Um, like I don't, it's, so it's not a size thing for me. I just know, I know who's safe and, and, and who really, you know, who's a bit out of control. So I, I've had to be, you know, a little, you know, especially when I'm injured, discriminate, uh, in that way, you know, it's, it, you just never know with some people and, and especially, you know, when they don't have nearly as many responsibilities, it's, it's, um, they have a lot less to lose than somebody like myself. If I get, uh, you know, if I can't, right. if I can't move my arm or shoulder, th- th- that's a big deal in my normal everyday to day life. Yeah. And there's no shame in that. I mean, we have guys who, you know, compete at the highest levels. And by the way, just uh, the, the gentleman that you mentioned earlier, Keon, uh, Keon Wilson. Uh, this is a guy who um, he's a former NFL player. He's been training with us less than a year, I believe. Yeah. Just went out to Vegas uh, for Master Worlds and won double gold at Blue Belt. Yeah. He won, his, he won the ultra heavyweight division and the absolute. Uh, this is a name that uh, people better get used to hearing. Because... Wait, the, the the absolute isn't that um, belts don't matter. No, he, they do an absolute at blue belt. So what so, what's the difference between absolute and and? Um... So if if there's an absolute absolute, that's anybody any belt any size. Uh, I don't believe they do that at World Masters. I could be wrong. Okay. Uh, I think they just have an absolute in every. Uh, belt level but that being said he did win the blue belt absolute and the ultra heavyweight and uh yeah this guy is you know there was no doubt when this guy stepped on the mat that he was going to be a world champion uh one day yeah at probably every belt level that he makes it i would i would assume right 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 yeah he he's um you know speaking of him it's it's really something else to see like i i've always been athletic you know when i was younger i could i could run really fast like a, you know a mile like in 430 or, or something like that i was pretty athletic but it's really something else to see somebody that just um is is different in that regard and and you when you see somebody that is truly used to be a world class athlete um it's it's different. It's it's completely different, and, and people just don't really realize that that there's some sometimes it it goes just beyond you know hard work and and trying your best and and all of that. It, there's just people out yeah. there that are that you you want to call it genetics, whatever the case may be. They're just they're just physically they are superior athletes at whatever whatever level or, or weight that you want to you know make those comparisons to. Um. You know, I was just watching, you know, a couple of days ago, the uh, or a couple of weeks ago at this time, the, the the world championships, and to see those level of athletes, it's it's night and day to com- you know, compared to, you know, a state or somebody who competes nationally. It's not, it's really not even close. Yeah, there's levels to everything, right? And it's like, you know, we we've trained with some guys on high levels, but then then there's there's levels, you know, there's the one percent. Right. And then there's the 1% of those. 1%. Oh, the 1%. Right. Right. You know, and, you know, grappling sports, you know, obviously the, the, the financial rewards, uh, even, even with mixed martial arts, uh, the financial rewards are nowhere near what, you know, more traditional sports like uh, American football or even football overseas or right. basketball or baseball, that those sports, you know, the reward financially is just so much greater if they were on even playing fields and we were to see like some of these NFL and NBA super athletes decide, Hey, I want to do judo or I want to do BJJ or I want to go into mixed martial arts, that level, you know, these guys with their athleticism just and translating it to that, these sports. I mean, we've already seen it, right? We, uh, I think that we, there's, there's a couple of guys that were, uh, you know, played in the NFL for, you know, that maybe they weren't superstars, but you know, they, they, they made rosters, they played games right. and, and went on to have high levels of success in MMA. I think the first like real superstar from MMA uh, that we've seen from the, like the NFL is like Greg Hardy. Yeah. Uh, I know he's not a popular person, uh, but you know, 
the guy hasn't been training mixed martial arts that long and you know just using his natural athleticism has got him by this far already and you know who who knows how good he'll be and how good is he going to be five years from now if he's still fighting yeah yeah i mean he's got age working against him unfortunately but um but yeah I, i i do agree that for as great as the athletes are in the ufc um, I still don't think the best athletes in the world are in the UFC. So, you know, imagine if you got some of the best ones out there, you know, competing at the UFC or other grappling events. What what would that look like? Um, right. I, I Now, I do think globally for judo, it is a little bit different because some of the country's best athletes are doing those are doing sports like judo, especially when I think of like the, the, the Georgian team or, or maybe even... Uh, well, certainly Japan is their best. Right. Their best athletes could be doing judo. Uh, smaller countries like Kazakhstan and and Uzbekistan, like their best athletes could be doing judo. It, it's it's so it's um and even Russia, you you got a segment of the the Russian population, uh, or or athlete or segment of the athletes that are just fantastic, incredible athletes. No, absolutely. Uh, you, and, you know. and those countries make it a little more, uh, you know. Uh, lucrative for for their athletes to actually compete where and here in the u.s you know if, you, if you're a stellar athlete coming out of high school and you know your choices are i could you know take the path to the nba or a path to potentially get to the nfl or the ufc you know the ufc is not going to be able to compete with that today if in the future if this you know the the financial rewards are on par and someone has an interest in in martial arts and these guys do start going that route, you know, like you said, we'll see that level uh, just escalate quickly. Yeah, ag- uh, completely agreed. Now, speaking of athletes and, y- y- you know, people who may have superior genetics or, or do have superior genetics uh, compared to us, just regular people and such. I sent you an article uh, earlier about this idea of Boyd Belts. Uh, and yes. there is a video that um, the Gracies, Henner, and and I can't remember the other guy's name. <laughs> the Kieran? Yeah, they're very charismatic. I, I like them a lot. I know a lot of people talk, for whatever reason, I don't understand it, that duck crap about them. But they really are very charismatic, you know, um, energetic, passionate people. And years ago, they came across, or, or I came across a video that they did on how to roll um, till you're 95 years old, or uh, how to how to how to transition to getting older in in jujitsu, and one of the topics that they came up with is this idea of Boyd belt. So basically, when it comes to effort um, and rolling with somebody, anybody that's 10 years younger is a belt per se, and somebody who's 20 pounds heavier. Is also another belt. So, for example, yeah, I'll get, I'll give you a perfect example here. There are there, there's a I don't know if I want to use his name, but um, there's okay. a fellow that's getting promoted me, with me. He's he's really good. Um, or, or that guy, I'm sorry, that got promoted with me. He's he's really good at jujitsu. He 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 goes all the time. Ah, oh, hell, he'll probably listen. I'm talking about Rambo. Um, yeah, and and that uh-huh. is his name. No, it's not that Rambo. There's a, there's a guy at the club. His name is Rambo. I'm assuming that's his real name. If it is, that's that's awesome. I mean that, I, I that's like, I, can you can you be named? That's like the second greatest name ever compared to yeah. Dick Butkus. That's that's yeah, the ultimate I, name. I wish I could tell you that was his real name, but uh, that was a nickname given to him. Uh, his first class, he came in and put on a camouflage headband. And our instructor immediately called him Rambo, and it's it stuck. stuck. So that's yes. Yeah, maybe maybe his real name's Dexter or something, or yeah. or, or Wolfgang. I don't know, but he's Rambo to Rambo me. To yeah. <laughs> but so when it comes to the Boyd belts, you know, Rambo is is you know, he's he's now a blue belt, uh, but we've been equal in terms of you know if you want to call it rank and white belt I, I don't put much stock in stripes i mean it's important but you you know what i mean yeah but he's like what 10 15 i certainly at least 10 he's got to be 27 years old and i'm i'm starting to approach 45 
And I got to yeah. tell you, from a that Boyd Belt standpoint, it feels, even though he's not nearly as skilled as you, I have to put as much effort into my roles with him as I do with you because because of that youth and 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 just his his energy and and strength and flexibility and and uh and all of that. So I was wondering if you had a chance to read the article and what you thought about that concept and whether or not you think there's any validity to that. So I'm I'm familiar with that article from years ago. Okay. Um, so yes, and it's 100% true. And Rambo is a prime example, you know. Uh, R- Rambo, uh, he trains with his, his his cousin, who also trains with us, Tony, who's who's a purple belt. Oh, that's and, his cousin. And, See, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, I thought so, they were just like best friends. I, I didn't know. Yeah. And those guys train together. I mean, they train together at the club, but they also train together at home. At they're home, savage. yeah. Those guys are savages. They're they're all, you know, those guys. Their trajectory for getting to black belt is at a much uh, steeper incline than anybody. I I mean, they're going to get there quick. Oh, yeah. All those guys are good. And they, you know, uh, the Boyd Belt uh, theory is 100% legit. You know, uh, Tony, for example, Tony, I I probably got like uh, 25 pounds on him, uh, but he's got, you know, I got 20 years on him yeah. in age. And although we're the same rank, uh, you know, with our belts, me rolling with him is like rolling with a brown belt. You know, it it, it actually, it adds a belt on to him. Yeah, uh, yeah. And same same with Rambo, right? So with Rambo being uh, almost 20 years your junior, it, it it's almost like he's already a purple belt. It, exactly. In terms of effort, you, you know, and yeah. – because I I've rolled with him a couple of times, like my goodness, I I mean I I couldn't I I think I managed to do it once, just just pass his guard, and but that was a for me it was a Herculean effort. It was really to, just like trying to pass yours is a Herculean effort, you know, and and you have so much more experience and and skill, um, but but just the youth and and um, yeah, and and the speed. Something- yeah, you can't. Those are things that you can't make up or teach, right? Yeah. Uh, and and going the other way, uh, the the same fellow that we were talking about earlier, uh, Keon Wilson, that guy came in as a white belt, right? Yeah. And he went to a tournament, entered the open division, and tapped black belt. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Now just think about that: a white belt tapped a, a high level black belt at a tournament and made it to the finals. And had he had more uh knowledge of the rules and how to use the rules to your advantage he would have won the tie he would have won the whole thing yeah right as a white belt. so and but there you go the, the, you know even though he's a little older than than most white belts when they start uh that athleticism and the the like you know we're talking about a guy who's probably two two thirty i don't want to put any weight on you cam but i'm i'm gonna, I'm gonna just say 230 just to, you know you're, you're being way kind <laughs> Uh, those 20 pounds yeah. and probably about 5% body fat, by the yeah, way. So yeah, like, exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So those, those 20 pounds are belt levels, right? So you could put like a, an experienced black belt in there. Who's 210 pounds. And here's a guy who's a, you know, he's a blue belt now, obviously, but that athleticism and th- that, you know, the, the 20 pounds, you you can throw add belts onto there. Now you're looking at a a, a, a strong brown belt at the Absolutely. least. Absolutely, right, right, right. And I, you know, key, key, that's another example. Me rolling with Keon is it's the same energy output and effort as like me rolling with uh, you know Chris, one of the instructors. Yeah, I mean, right. obviously and- the skills level is is way different, but but in terms of energy and effort, it's it feels the same. It's just uh, you know and, such and that, a, such and- a challenge. And the only reason it feels the same is because he's being nice. Exactly. Right. If he really want, you know, if he, if, if, if it was go time, you know, he could Hulk smash any of us. Yeah. I think, I think Keon could, could literally uh, rip my arm from my socket. I mean, I, I think yeah. he could. Um, <laughs> it's disgusting as that is, but, uh, but yeah, so it's, 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 uh, it's a theory that I've, I I think also applies to judo as well. Though I would say 
I would say when it comes to quote unquote void belts, applying it to judo, once you get past 30 years old, instead of every 10 years, I think it's every five years I, I, in terms of speed. And um, at, at least I've noticed that since I hit 35, because I was no, when I hit 40, I was nowhere near as fast as I was at 35. And even at 44, I'm nowhere near as fast as I was when I was 40. I mean, yeah. I am definitely... seeing the the slowdown. Uh, even though I'm doing the best judo of my life, and I feel like lately I've taken that next step in my development. But but man, as far as athleticism, I like I'm really seeing a slowdown. It's I have to be smarter and more technical and and, and just more savvy. Yeah, no, you're, you're right. The 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 decline comes much more rapidly once you you hit that 35. You, you know year old 40 year old yeah it's not like every 10 years you're getting slower it's every two years you're losing a little, it, you, you know? really yeah yeah absolutely and it's um it's it's really interesting to see um because i think when it comes to judo competitions and masters competitions i think judo has it right they they spread those divisions out by about every five years and um i don't think jujitsu does that is it is that correct except for the big events yeah, you. I'd, I'd have to research it more, but I, I believe that the um, like the Masters Worlds that just happened. Um, I think it was a uh, every ten years, maybe. I, I would have to double check that. So I think for jujitsu, every ten years could actually work because obviously it's mostly on the ground, but I don't. You know, in judo, if it was every 10 years, that would be totally unfair <laughs> to somebody 45, you know, going against somebody who's 35. That would just be crazy. And I know a lot of smaller judo tournaments, you, you really don't have a choice um, because very few adults actually show up to compete. But um, so, yeah, so those those boy belts, I, I really do like the uh, that that concept. I think it applies to judo. I think the weight aspect of it also applies to judo as well. Yeah, yeah. For sure, you, we've all done, you know, Ron Dory with somebody who's got quite a few pounds on us, and you know, where normally we would be able to move somebody around with, with you know, your kazushi or your 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 grips or whatever. Uh, somebody that has that much weight on you, and you you, you can't do anything with them, so it's like it, it, it seems pointless sometimes. No. We're both about the same weight, more or less. We're in that range and certainly the same age. Do you tone it down, regardless of rank in both judo and jiu-jitsu? Uh, do, you tone, do you tone it down when you're going with somebody that you've got 30 pounds on, let's say? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think it's the same concept like I was saying earlier about rolling with, with a lower belt. If if I'm doing rondori with with uh, someone who's 130 pounds and you know i take a nice overhand grip on them and just snap them down or you know yank them a circle out or whatever that's not something that i'm normally going to be able to do with someone like if me and you are going right someone right close to my size so realistically it wouldn't make any sense for me to to do that to uh, someone that, that I outweigh by that, that, that much. So I try to, to gauge my game according, not only according to their, their, their belt level, but also their size and even age sometimes. Right. Uh, if I'm going with somebody younger than me, I know that they're faster than me. So I might use my gripping to kind of mitigate some of that speed, but I'm not going to overcompensate by trying to overpower them. If that makes any sense. Yeah, it does. And you know, what's funny. I don't know about you, but in my experience, nobody that's got 30, 40, 50 pounds on me and, and, and up in judo has ever given me, has ever gone light. I, at least that's how it feels anyway. You know, yeah. I, no, I think what it is is they get used to playing a big man game. Yeah. It, you know what I mean? And it's like, uh, they can't just all of a sudden become super finesse technique player when, when they go with you. They're used to, you know, uh, taking big man grips, you know, maybe like the underhook to the belt grip or that over the top back grip. 
you know, and once they've got that on you, you know, you know especially with, like you said, with the weight differential, not much that we can do at that point. So, yeah, you're right. When, whenever you go with somebody bigger, it, it uh, I try not to be that guy. Uh, it's rare that I'm go- that much bigger than anyone, but if right. I'm going with somebody that I have a little size on, I do. I still try to play my game and not. Oh, did I lose you? Joe? Joe, what's happening? Where'd you go? No, don't leave me. <laughs> Joe. <laughs> Why did you go, Joe? Why? I guess he just lost connection there. Very sad. Because we had so much more to get to. All right. I'm not sure what happened, but uh, what was left on the agenda that I wanted to discuss with Joe, since he has departed us, is some of the misconceptions and really flat-out bad statements when it comes to Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And oftentimes when I hear this kind of stuff, it's usually coming from Judo guys. And I I don't know why. Well, I I have an idea why. I've always maintained that. There's a segment of the population that really believe uh, the Gracie family hoodwinked the entire uh, viewing audience when it came to UFC 1, claiming that it was Gracie Jiu-Jitsu and not Judo, um, what they used in the Octagon. Gosh, we're talking about, what, 25 years ago at least? And it seems ever since then, at least on, gosh, so many internet forums and such, there has always been this Judo versus uh, BJJ debate. And now... There's, there's two things that I do agree with the judo side on this argument. Is that one, there wasn't anything that Hoist Gracie did in UFC 1 that was uniquely Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And to be fair to the, the, to the detractors out there, it definitely was all judo. There, there wasn't anything, and I've said this before many times on, on the podcast, there wasn't anything that Hoist Gracie did in those early UFCs that was uniquely Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Everything that he did, you could easily find in a judo textbook. You could you could learn in a judo class. It wasn't there wasn't anything unique. It was all judo. That uh, that much I agree with. And I also agree with uh, uh, another point of contention which I I'm going to get to a little bit later is that Brazilian jiu-jitsu does not teach or practice uh takedowns and throws in a very effective way. Now, I, I want to clarify, that's just been my experience in in my own club and some of the other clubs that I've visited over the past 20 years or so. And I'm not saying that there aren't jiu-jitsu clubs out there that have good takedowns and good throws. I know there's one, the one that Travis Stevens is associated with, and I can't remember the name of it, but I know that many of their jiu-jitsu students are shodan level uh, judoka, in my opinion, from what I watch them do Rondori with Travis and moving around and stuff. They know what they're doing, and I know there's a lot of clubs out there that are like that. I apologize for that notification on my phone. Moving along. And I would also say that there are blue belts and, and some purple belts at my club that have never that never actually taken a real throw uh, in their lives or even have a an actual reliable takedown. I, I, I'm not talking about double legs either because that's just – well, I – that's not the best takedown to use when doing gi training. And I'm specifically just talking about gi training at the moment. And to be fair, I'm not talking about everyone. But I, I've definitely come across some people at my own club that's literally never taken a fall and they're not white belts. So the criticism coming from the judo side of things with, with those two points I, I think are are fair and accurate. But I, that's where I stop with my agreement just with those two points because there's a lot of nonsense uh talking about brazilian jiu-jitsu is you know basically just judo that's what bjj stands for i don't agree with that and and i i want to put some perspective on the sport starting with the fact that i think that the tractors out there have to understand and realize that brazilian jiu-jitsu is a very different sport from judo it's it's just because they do a lot of ground techniques and some of the submissions are the same it's it's a completely different sport where its focus is to allow the ultimate amount of freedom on the ground 
to either submit or or dominate your opponent just just by points. I mean, there there is a point system that I'm sure many of the detractors are not aware of, and even if they are, they just look at it as inferior, which is a shame because the point system is 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 based off of advancement of position and the ultimate position to be in uh, within the context of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is is mount and and rear mount. And, and this is where I get frustrated with a, a lot of the detractors. There's, and I used to be this guy. I, 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 full, I put it out there. I used to be this guy many years ago. Um, and I've seen this guy roll, come this kind of guy, quote unquote guy, come up into Brazilian Jiu Jitsu clubs, into our clubs. You know, the people sometimes people come into Jiu Jitsu and they feel from Judo and they feel like they've got to defend the belt in a way. They've got to defend the honor of Judo or something like that. And so what will happen is a Judo guy will come into a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu club and, you know, they'll they'll do Nawaza or whatever and they'll get like Keisa Katami or or Yoko Shio Katami and just kind of hang out there for for maybe you know, three three minutes out of the five minute roll and not really do anything, and then they just kind of walk away, you know, in their own way, just thinking that they've done something. And quite frankly, you you didn't. I mean, just because you hold somebody in side control for for three minutes, it's it's meaningless in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. It's meaningless within the context of that sport. And then the Jiu Jitsu guy will compliment you, shake your hand, and be like, "Hey, man, you're really strong." Which, if you don't know, in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, if somebody tells you you're strong, uh, that's almost a reason to go. That's 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 an insult. That's not that's not a compliment. So, Judo guys, be aware of that. You don't want to be strong. All right, where was I? So yeah, I've seen Judo guys do this over the years where they hold somebody down with all their effort without attempting a submission or without attempting to I- improve their position. And, and it's like, you know, then they, the mag, the role ends, and it's like they walk away thinking that they're victorious, that they accomplished some great feat. And the fact of the matter is is that you're not impressing anybody if you do that. Now, don't get me wrong. There's certainly value in in maintaining and securing a position before you go for a submission, but... You know, in judo, obviously, well, actually not obvious to anybody who's from Brazilian jiu-jitsu, you can win um, if you hold down your opponent for 20 seconds. And in judo, you can, you know, if somebody's got like a scarf hold, case of katami on you, and the person on bottom racks, wraps their leg around uh, your leg, that's considered a broken hold down. In jiu-jitsu, that's meaningless. That doesn't, that doesn't mean anything. And, you know, there's a lot of times where judo guys just turtle up. And, and in jiu-jitsu, that is not a good position. You're, you're, you're basically exposing your back. And, of course, you know, you got the judo guys that come in there. You know, they, they turtle up like and, and they're like a rock and they're very hard to move. But it's like you're – when I see that, I, I just think to myself, dude, you're not, you're not impressing anybody here. You're not actually doing Brazilian jiu-jitsu. You're just doing judo in a Brazilian jiu-jitsu class. And then conversely, a lot of times, I, I, I've over the years, I've read stories where like, well, you know, I had this Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt uh, visit us at, at, at our club, and I, I didn't see anything special there. He was, he didn't do anything special with our black belts. I mean, they all held them down for like 20 seconds, and, and that was that. And, and it's, again, it's completely different sports. And, and to that point, I think even a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt would have challenges in a judo competition, if he if he formed his entire strategy around getting the person to the ground and and holding that person there, it's very difficult to win on the ground in judo. And the time allotted does not allow for the kind of uh, freedom and movement uh, that you often see in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. You you don't get that freedom and movement in judo competitions. So as a result, when it comes to judo, you develop grapplers that are very fast, that are very explosive, and, and that's a that's a unique skill set in of itself. And there are many jiu-jitsu practitioners that are fast and explosive as well, but that is typically not how the game is played in jiu-jitsu. And as a result, the level of detail of securing techniques like like uh, you know sankaku jime or uh, Juji Katami and 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 th- different things like that. The level of detail is is so much more 
in depth compared to what I've seen in judo in in many cl- in, in many clubs. It's just it's night and day. So the techniques may be the same. You know, an arm bar is the same in judo as it is in jiu-jitsu. You know, a triangle choke is the same in judo as it is in jiu-jitsu. But the way that you get there is completely different. And and I don't think that those differences are respected by some people in in judo. Now, with regards to judo, I am strictly talking about IJF judo. But, you know, there's also freestyle judo. But even in freestyle judo, you cannot uh, do leg bars and heel hooks and or, or knee bars and leg locks and things like that. You cannot do that in freestyle judo. So when it comes to sport grappling, I do believe that Brazilian jiu-jitsu has the most freedom and deepest level of skill set. And look, I don't want to get emails from people, well, you haven't been to Japan. You haven't seen what we do in Japan and in this and that. That may all be well and true, but again, in Kosen judo competitions, there are no leg locks. There are no heel hooks. There, there are no straight ankle locks in Kosen judo. So... You essentially have an entire area of the body that's left untouched by by submissions, and in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu they allow that stuff. They allow a lot. They allow they allow a lot of things at at, at black belt level that goodness I I would be very uncomfortable uh, with being put in those type of positions because I I just don't see them as as much, you know. And, and every time I do a role with anybody um, that's blue belt level and up, I I usually tell them, look, if you if you see a straight ankle lock or, or a leg bar there, feel free to take it because I need to learn to defend against it. And that's true because in judo, you don't have to worry about that stuff. You don't have to think about where are you leaving your limbs? How are you you know positioning your body so that you don't get caught in those kind of submissions? Also, let's not forget that Brazilian jiu-jitsu allows wrist locks as well. And I've been caught in a few of those. So my overall point is that if you want to be a well-rounded grappler, that adheres to the least amount of rule sets. The only way you're going to become the most well-rounded grappler, in my opinion, is through Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, unless your judo club trains leg locks, heel hooks, wrist locks, and that kind of thing. But you know, but ultimately, the rules of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu just create a different type of grappler, just like the rules of judo do. And as I mentioned earlier, there are plenty of fantastic people who are in judo that don't need leg locks, heel hooks, and you know, ankle locks to completely dominate a person on the ground. And within the context of judo rules, they are fantastic grapplers and a force to be reckoned with. There's no question about that. But ju- Brazilian jiu-jitsu is as different of a sport as baseball is to cricket. I mean, that's probably the closest thing I can compare it to just because they swing a some sort of a bat and they throw some sort of a ball it doesn't make it the same game and it's just it's just a different game so I really don't understand why there's all this jealousy and, and hate toward jiu-jitsu it has it is bringing people on the mats that would never do any sort of grappling sport and and that's where judo as, as a whole in this country has failed the the adult practitioner has been alienated by judo. I have been saying that for almost three years that I've been doing this podcast. Adult beginners don't matter, generally speaking, in judo. But in Brazilian jiu-jitsu, they throw those doors wide open and they're treated like gold. So anyway, I'm not going to delve further into that because I, I've i covered that uh, many times uh, over the years. So, so I think I'm going to end the podcast on that note. So if I pissed you off, insulted you, got something wrong, or, or overall you just want to tell me how much you hate my guts or tell me how much you love the show, feel free to email me at judochopsuishow at gmail.com. I encourage all of my listeners to follow me on Instagram, which is at La Vida Judoka. You can also follow me on Twitter at La Vida Judoka. And since it's football season, I'm doing a lot of posts on Twitter with, related to, uh, re- with regards to football and and with that in mind, if you are on DraftKings and you want to challenge me to a head-to-head matchup in, in DraftKings for football, feel free to also look me up at La Vida Judoka. You can find the Facebook page um, if you search for Judo Chop Suey Show. And you can also find me on Facebook as well if you search for David Roman. Just if you do, please send me a personal message saying that you are a listener to the show and I'll add you as a friend because if you don't, I'm just going to ignore you. Your friend request will just end up in friend request purgatory where I don't delete it, but I don't acknowledge it either. Too many Russian bots that I have to sit through. 
So thank you for tuning in. Um, on my next episode, I'm probably going to cover the Brasilia Grand Slam, which is happening, let's see, the weekend, I believe, of October 5th. And if I'm not mistaken, Teddy Bernier is going to be competing, which is great. I can't wait to see that. So anyway, I'm going to cut things off here. I'll leave it at that. So I hope you all have a great day. I hope you all have a great rest of the week. Train hard. Stay safe out there. And until next time, I'm out. Open Gangnam Style.